Hey guys, what's up? It is week 292, and uh, yeah, so I know that the episodes have been getting a little shorter. Uh, fo- hopefully over a Christmas break, they'll be a little longer. I know I'm trying to cram in some 2022 reviews, and I've had a lot of extra stuff like Tear on Track, 80s Tear on Track stuff shot, and another 1981 done, but I just need time to edit. I've not had a lot of time. Uh, yeah, so uh, let's hop into the reviews right now. And the first one up is uh, uh, from New Line Vidcrest. Um, I believe this is a um, Diabolic DVD company. I'm not 100% sure. And this is Hallucination, or also known as Hallucination Generation from 1966. And this is supposedly like the first movie to use LSD in it, which is kind of crazy, kind of cool, 66. And, uh, you know, it did remind me of um, what was the one, uh, The Hook Generation by William Griffey in a lot of ways. This is a, a bizarre black and white movie now it's been re-edited some of the parts some of the weird lsd kind of tripping moments seem to be more updated but the original version is on here as well so uh there's one actor in here who's got like a big name george montgomery and he's very familiar to me his voice and everything like that so essentially what we have here is kind of like uh these this group of kind of losers or not even losers young kids that are drink, doing a lot of drugs and partying hanging out in like spain uh they're kind of like i would say like just kind of lost and there's George Montgomery character who is like a philosophy professor that kind of takes him under this wing and he just hangs around them and kind of manipulates them and gives them drugs and all sorts of things like that the opening of this movie opens up like what was the the crazy movie that Cohen put out uh, Cohen Media that uh, geez it's uh, dementia and it opens up in that kind of crazy nightmare sequence that movie uh, which is a really wild film um, this one kind of has a similar vein like that. It opens up with like kind of edited strange, like there's a murder and just uh, kind of hallucination, obviously factoring in the LSD trip. And then we kind of get into the, the, the story and, and as we progress, we learn who the characters are. They're like there's a five or six of these kind of main kids that hang around George Montgomery. And you see how awful he treats his wife and everything like that. Now, I'm not sure if the, uh, the narration in here was added in later to kind of patch in some of the story. A lot of low budget movies will do that. That Dementia movie, I think, does it as well in certain versions. But uh, to be 100% uh, honest, it, it did work with the movie. It, it didn't seem super obvious like a lot of the other cheap movies I do see. And it, the fair, movie is fairly effective, much better than expected. When you see something like this, you think maybe it's going to be like low-grade, you know, Andy Milligan or, you know, a bad William Griffey movie. But that's not what it is. It was actually pretty impressive for what it was. I thought the characters were fairly interesting and I thought George Montgomery was great and manipulation was top notch from him in the film. So what happens is, uh, you know, some of the people are uh, kind of convinced to carry on kind of this awful kind of crime and uh, the main characters kind of has an innocent quality about him, although he is kind of a loser, kind of lost person and it kind of just shows the manipulation. The movie ends at the perfect time. That's one thing I like about a lot of older movies, you know, um, even when you go back to Universal, they just end abruptly. Now maybe that's a little too abruptly, but a lot of the 60s and 70s movies they have this downbeat ending they just end now a movie like baby driver which i'm referencing here which is a great movie i love that movie by edgar wright it it goes into the courtroom case afterwards and i felt like baby driver would have just been more impactful if it just straight up ended when he's in the car at the standoff i think that would have been a more 70s kind of style film which is more what i gravitate towards while it had the ending latched on kind of helps a lot of it makes it more modern and probably smooths down a little bit for people but um uh this one has the rough edges and and, you know even though if you are honest and you didn't do exactly what you're said to have done you know you were guilty by association guilty by manipulation and I, i thought that was kind of a nice factor in the film there is an interview with um behind the scenes producer commentary and he talks about you know meeting some celebrities because of this you know famous uh, I can't remember what that guy is but the Rolling Stones pulled him over once and said you're the guy who made the LSD movie pretty wild stories uh, and the movie's actually really interesting in a lot of ways so Hallucination or Hallucination Nation uh, Generation sorry I thought it was actually a pretty cool film the, the cover art's pretty wild pretty minimalistic I guess but anyways uh, yeah I think that's probably the original cover art to be honest there was a slip cover version of this as well I would recommend checking this out especially if you like stuff like the Hook Generation generation not as violent as that and i would say it's a little bit more psychological i would say i don't want to compare it to like private property with war notes or something like that i think that movie is better 
of course, you know, I think more artsy, maybe not more artsy, but I, I do kind of put it in like a mixture mixture of the hook generation and private property, which is a weird combination, I know, but that's what I would go with. So hallucination generation, pretty cool stuff. Okay, next up from RLJ Entertainment here is going to be Creep Show Season 3. Now I'm doing this in two parts. We're going to do disc one this week and probably disc two next week or the week after um, because, you know, I can't just dedicate four and a half hours to one series. I don't typically do series, but I did cover seasons one and two. So we're going to do season three. I am a huge fan of the original Creep Show film, even like part two. Love the EC Comics, Tales of the Crypt stuff. I love Tales of the Crypt, all that stuff, the, the old movies from Amicus. I love anthology stuff. I love anthology shows, Twilight Zone. So this is totally my jam. Now, I did enjoy the first season. I thought some episodes were hot and cold. I thought the second season overall was an improvement. And I got to tell you, the first six episodes of season three all are really good. Um, I feel like they've improved on the uh, special effects, the scripts, the budget. Everything went up. Um, the funny thing I will mention about uh, a Creep Show season three is um, so like the lead actors are always like a list, like or like a list performances. Like oh, they're fucking tremendous. Now they'll always have like a, a kind of side character or somebody else in there. And they're kind of just not up to snuff, and it's just like uh, you see like a list performance next to like a C list, and it, it, it's a little jarring at times. Nothing to destroy anything. So let me go in and kind of talk about the episodes here, what I have. Um, so there's basically six episodes all together of Creep Show, but there's two shows in each one. Like, so the first episode was Mums. I'm going to go by this. And I believe that uh, Rusty uh, Cuddiff, Cuddiff, a cutoff or whatever, did that. And he, he worked out some of the Tales in the Hood stuff. He wrote the first one and directed maybe the second one and third one. I can't remember 100%. But Mums. And this is based off of uh, a Joe Hill story, if I'm not mistaken. I believe this is um, the Rusty story. And it has Ethan Emby in it. And, and what is his name? Ethan, I can always mispronounce his name. Ethan Embry. And Ethan Embry is a great actor. He's been working forever, and he always impresses me. And it kind of reminded me, his performance in this is kind of very similar to his Masters of Horror episode by Don Coscarelli, um, Incident at a Mountaintop or something like that. He plays kind of this, like, white supremacist, backwoods kind of style terrorist character. And he does a survivalist and that, and he plays that kind of same character here. Um, I think his performance in this is better. I think he was um, phenomenal. When, I was always excited to see him. He's in, um, what's that, um, Devil's Candy, if, if you guys are horror fans. But he's in a million movies. And this guy, um, every time he pops up, he looks different. He sounds different. He changes his body. Um, tremendous actor, by the way. In fact, um, underappreciated actor. You don't really uh, understand how important and pivotal, pivotal he is to something he's in. Until, you know, you're watching him and you're like, oh shit, this guy. His eyes are perfect. So basically this story falls, um, and they're short too, so it's hard to just uh, give you the rundown without spoiling everything. Um, we have a, a son who I believe the son is actually uh, the little brother or the older brother in Psycho Gorman. And he like has these parents, you know, the mom and dad are always fighting. The mom is trying to escape back to her old family ways. They seem to be Wiccans or some sort of strange old religion, relics, something like that. Talking about their mother being very old. And uh, they, they seem to kind of have something to do with the plants. Um, it's funny, the title of the thing is called Mums, but it also means the plant. It also means moms. Like, you know what I mean? Double meaning there. Nice, nice, nice little touch there. And the father is this kind of, uh, you know, extremist, uh, terrorist kind of guy. Anyways, what happens is something tragic and there's going to be revenge. It's classic Just Desserts, which is the documentary name of Creep Show movie but just desserts is a staple in anthology horror and it just does that wonderfully the special effects are really cool in this uh plant creatures i love them i love the mixture of plant and persons and it's just a lot of fun i thought this one was one of the very good very good i, I can't rank them all because they're all very solid so and i'm surprised they're all this good i enjoyed every one of them the other episode with this one is called queen bee and uh this one's fun it's definitely taking you know kind of like uh poking fun at the younger generation here, being obsessed with, you know, like a music uh, a person, a, a, a pop star. Um, basically, they're going to give birth and it's very secretive. Somehow, one of the kids, like mom's is a nurse, they figure out about it. They're going to sneak in and try to get, uh, you know, a picture of Queen Bee, you know, her her child and her and everything like that. One of them wants to sell it to the highest bidder. When they get there, they realize that, you know, Queen Bee is not exactly human and the baby and everything like that is not exactly what they were hoping to see. So it gets really crazy, really 
really weird. Um, the major special effect here is a lot of fun. This one's cute. Uh, I think I prefer Mums. I think that that one had a better impact, but this one is really cool too, and it kind of does a nice little statement about you know obsession and fandom and that. It's really good. This one's really solid as well and very fun. Um, then the next one up for the second episode, the first one of the second episode, we have Skeletons in the Closet. Now this is, a, I think Greg Nicotero probably did this one, or he was definitely involved with it. You know, Greg Nicotero is the showrunner, and Greg Nicotero worked directly with Romero and, and Savini, so he's like a Romero, you know, pupil, Savini pupil kind of deal, which is really cool because, you know, Greg Nicotero worked on The Walking Dead, but also he's Johnson in Day of the Dead. He did special effects in Day of the Dead. He's the K and B. He's the, uh, you know, uh, Nicotero. He's the N in K and B. You know, special effects, you know, one of the best of all time. Greg Nicotero. So, and uh, one of the coolest guys for, for making this creep show series. And it's, I'm glad it's in good hands with somebody like his, or, you know, I'd love to have Savini or somebody like that. I just love that it's in a Romero friend, friendly person's hands. And it does have that Romero flavor at times, which I love. Um, so this one, Skeletons in the Closet. Now, this is about this whore collector that has a museum, him and his wife. And um, it's very, you know, winky at the the audience because they know who they're dealing with. You'll see props from everything in here, from, you know, Don Coscarelli's sphere from Phantasm to, you know, Jason Voorhees' mask. And they go even deeper where you even see a little bit of the creep show, you know, skeleton in here. Um, there's this really great kind of myth um, where, you know, they always talk about real skeletons used in movies. And, and that's part of it, too, the props in here. I love that kind of stuff. Very cool. Um very entertaining just to kind of just see spot out things like what's this from what's that from and uh yeah this one's enjoyable it's cute it's very funny um james remar is in it who i absolutely love james remar you know he's raiden in mortal Kombat 2 but he's also in tales from the dark side he's in some walter hill films he's in a uh, black coat's daughter james remar is an exceptional actor always top notch got a really raspy voice he's kind of a tough guy he's in django on jane good stuff and he has a romero connection you because romero produced tales of dark side which is nice so this one's really fun uh the other one on here is familiar and this one is probably my least favorite although the special effects are really good and that doesn't mean anything negative towards it so this one's kind of like you know a couple go to like get their palms read or something like that and go to this person and and a familiar follows him home uh this says a huge shout out to the crate which is a uh, episode uh, you know a short segment in the original creep show which is one of the better ones of course they're all great in the original creep show has a shout out to the crate which is very lovely uh, special effects are really fun you know this creature this familiar attaches himself to this guy and he kind of loses his mind you know typical uh, anthology horror good stuff though um Okay, then we have the last to Zabara, and this one was one of the best ones, if not the best one here. So we have this artist that has like this huge backstory. He painted these very violent pictures, and he has like this very rich history of who he is, and his paintings are very sought after. So everybody's kind of fighting over this. This last ancestor of his is to receive this painting that is in this this case, this chest, and it's blocked off. Enter this rich billionaire, I would say, and he's just a complete douchebag. He plays it to a T. He's absolutely wonderful in this. He, uh, as a horrible person, you you want to kill him. He's great in it. Um, I could not stand him. So this guy basically, um, he buys the painting and he does something completely awful in the worst way. But of course, this this famous artist is going to come back and kind of haunt him in a way and he's haunted by this creature that he saw in this painting and it's really fun it's really cool it kind of brings up you know like it reminds me of those ideas like the the great yoki yokais the yokais and stuff like that the monster the japanese monster style you know history and mythology and also the paintings that this uh, japanese guy does some of them look like you know chronos you know when chronos is eating like zeus and shit and, the, 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 and it's just really kind of gnarly stuff um also reminds me of attack on titan that that whole thing that attack on titan in general reminds me of that painting Kronos eating the you know his children but yes uh you know I think that this one's really good and I think it's interesting and I think it's fun and I think it's a cool thing because there's a lot of these movies now that come out and they're kind of like poking fun at artists or the art crowd when you have Velvet Buzzsaw or the new Candyman it's, it's kind of like a subgenre it's always been there you know with Bucket of Blood and stuff like that and uh Color Me Blood Red but I think like they kind of have this like high art pretentiousness and nowadays that I think works really well in these so I really enjoyed this one um, I lost my spot, but the last one is, um, that I'm going to be covering is okay. I'll bite. And this is a prison story. I really enjoyed this one. We have this guy who is kind of, he doesn't really belong in prison for what he did, but of course he's very sympathetic and he's obsessed with, uh, you know, I believe, uh, Egyptian kind of culture and gods and mythology and spiders, you know, uh, arachnids, you know, tarantulas, all these kind of things. And he, uh, has all these in his cell, but there's a secret one in his cell, right? So, uh, basically one of the prison guards gives him a hard time all the time along with these two prisoners, these cons, they beat him, 
they make him, you know, do chem chemist stuff for them because he was a chemist, mix drugs, make drugs for him, and he's constantly beat. One day they cross the line and uh, they do something to something he loves, and of course there's going to be a just desserts revenge. This one is super wild, it's super weird, and the special effects are really cool. They do have some CGI in the entire series. Some of the CGI blood splatter is iffy, but they use as much practical as they can, and it works really well. It's really fun. And this one at the end, the reveal of what the fuck happened to our main character here is really cool. Probably my second favorite of the bunch, or or maybe um, I really like the first one as well. I was very happy with all these. I really like uh, Mom's all of them are good like i don't have any that are so different from the other ones so all six are great um that's the first disc and then we'll have another six episodes next time that i'm looking forward to checking out it is on shutter and then finally I will mention that this has a 35-minute kind of panel, a Comic-Con panel, and it has Greg Nicotero on there, um, Rusty Cudliffe, uh, James Remar, uh, one of the directors, I can't think of her name, Johnny Toe, um, Michael Rooker. I said Michael Rooker, James Remar, Rusty, Rusty is on there, um, Greg Nicotero, and one of the directors. And that's great because they talk about the Romero connections. Rooker, I haven't seen Rooker's episode yet, but Rooker being in The Dark Half by Romero and, and Remar being in Tales of the Dark Side produced by George Romero and then we have Greg Nicotero kind of like talking about he's like you know it's funny that you know I'm bringing in the Romero regulars or people that worked with Romero before and that's really cool and kind of keep that you know that alive and, and I like that because Romero's my favorite his legacy should live on forever because he's the best and his move and he had a special quality about him and I'm glad that people like you know uh, Nicotero are carrying on his legacy even though I don't love the Walking Dead series uh, if anybody was going to be the showrunner I mean it's somebody that you know should benefit from Romero it should be somebody that you know learned or was around Romero if that makes any sense to anybody um, and if there's ever a remake of Day of the Dead or something or, or you know I'd, I'd really like Savini or, or Nicotero to do it or something you know I really just hand them the Day of the Dead remake please stop making these shitty movies in Bulgaria that have nothing to do with Day of the Dead alright so uh, yeah that panel was really fun too you know I'm a big fan of a lot of those guys and, and people on there That and it was interesting to hear them talk about it so yeah that is Creep Show Season 3 Disc 1 next week will be Disc 2 I or the week after really enjoyed it so far good season uh, good stuff very enjoyable okay the next one up is from Culture Shock and this movie is freaking bonkers this is Mind, Body, and Soul um, and I really like Culture Shock they, they put out the weirdest freaking movies and this has Ginger Lynn Allen in there and a Wings Hauser gotta love Wings Hauser this is actually directed by Rick Salone or Salone I, th I don't remember how to say his name but he directed Hobgoblins here's a confession as much as I love little creature films I made a couple I never watched Hobgoblins I need to I need to rectify that I hear it's awful do not care so Rick there's, there's interviews on here with Ginger uh, Lynn and Rick Salone and some other people as well so Mind, Body, and Soul is from 1992 I'd never seen it and uh, let me say this Ginger Lynn and Wings Hauser seem to be the most grounded people in the movie the most grounded performances and so that says a lot because Wings Hauser is bonkers so basically the opening film uh, of the movie has Ginger Lynn being invited to this play this weird kind of cult sacrifice with her uh, boyfriend she doesn't know what's going on there's a woman you see her breast she's about to be uh, you know sacrificed these cops bust in all the cult members run and she's left stranded uh, basically the police don't believe her or anything like that and i believe the main police officer wasn't he in hollywood chainsaw hookers am i mistaking or was he in blood sucking pharaohs in pittsburgh one of those movies i believe he's in i can't remember i believe it's uh hollywood chainsaw hookers so basically they don't believe her um wings hauser sees her situation and he um you know wants he's a defense attorney he comes in and says listen i'm gonna post your bail i'm gonna help you figure this case out they start to live together a little bit and what happens is you know uh the cops are after her, but the cult members are not gonna let her go so so the cult members are constantly after her. It kind of reminds me of a super low rent Devil Rides Out by Hammer, but not, but completely silly and nonsensical. So Ginger Lynn makes the worst decisions ever. Like she's like, I'm going to be on the TV show when somebody calls without consulting her lawyer. She talks to the cops without consulting her lawyer. They really make her out to be kind of a dumb character, which is unfortunate. But hey, it is what it is. In fact, most of the characters in the movie are dumb, so I wouldn't say it's any one person they're pointing out. But it's really silly and stupid. But it it, it has its charm. I'm not going to lie. I love Wingshauser. I love watching. Them. A couple weeks ago, I watched Nightmare at Noon. I, I just enjoy him. Ginger Lynn's actually okay in it, although the characters are not written super realistically. So there's over-the-top chewing scenery like Ginger Lynn's friend or like one of the goons that's in the cult who's a security guard. He's absolutely ridiculous. Um, the one scene that stands out above the rest of the film is when they go to kind of a psychic reader, uh, kind of black, you know, priestess. And uh, she, she basically 
does this resurrects this demon on how to help this one woman fight a hex on her and the demon kind of pops up and kind of like a, a you know a, a kind of transparent and starts talking and it's genuinely looks creepy as shit the special effects on it are great and it's like you need a coffin nail and i was just like this is way scarier than the rest of the movie it's way more effective than the rest of the movie because the rest of the movie is kind of silly and ridiculous and over the top and very 90s and you know has a little sexy time in it um i enjoyed the movie i think it's nonsense but that's exactly what you kind of expect for these things um and culture shock's been putting out a lot of fun stuff um yeah it looks great too i was very impressed at how it looked um and the sound and everything it's, it's a really solid blu-ray release so if you're a fan there's some special features on there i would recommend checking out mind body and soul which uh the name comes from actually the demon saying it it can attack your um your mind or your body and your soul but not your mind so yeah there we go mind body and soul recommended for people that know what they're getting into i enjoyed it i thought it was very fun Okay, we're going to do a couple 2022 releases, uh, new ones, and this one is Smile. Now, I rented Smile. I, I think I signed up for, I can't remember, is it Paramount Plus or something like that? And I had some good things about Smile. Um, so I put this in, and right away I know, like, I knew it was similarities to It Follows, which is a, a compliment. And I then I was like, oh, wow. And then It Follows to me reminds me very much of, like, a Japanese kind of style ghost story. It had a lot of similarities as The Ring and stuff like that. And, and this movie came out, like, 2014, six, like, eight, almost ten years ago, guys. So It Follows came out almost ten years ago. And I'm looking at, so I'm checking out reviews. I was like, I really thought this movie was pretty impressive. So I get on smile i start looking at the reviews and everybody says you know making fun of it shit follows or jump scare the movie or this is just a rip off of it follows and i start thinking i'm like you guys really haven't been watching horror movies for the last 30 years because half the shit that everybody loves is just rip offs i mean in the same breath of people making fun of smile for having similarities to it follows will praise a bruno mate movie you're all just full of shit. Like, uh, I, I, so that's what it is. I understand if some people think it's shameless or just don't like the movie. That's perfectly fine. But um, it does have a lot of similarities to It Follows, but that's perfectly acceptable to me because I think it can stand on its own enough. And I think this is a genuinely scary movie and it has some really serious stuff in it. And I, I definitely want to rewatch this before the end of the year. So the movie opens up. So spoilers here. I, I For the most part, I thought it was really great, really scary. And the ending kind of scared the shit out of me. And, and visually, it made me very uncomfortable. So the opening of the film, it opens with this really dark scene of uh you know somebody who's laying in bed a suicide or, or death and this like depression is just portrayed so accurately by just visually store visual storytelling you see the woman laying in the bed you see that she's laying on her side she's dead in her eyes her room is riddled with pills and it's just this long tracking shot and the thing that got me was she's laying on her side and you see the streak on her sh on her sheets of her tears and i was just like that little detail is is rough that's rough stuff you know and it's just she cried there laid there and cried and she died over something and you know and it just spreads to the room and it gets worse and it's more dirty and dirty and dirty and, th and then we kind of realize that this is the haunting image or haunting moment of our lead character here and this whole element with her and the mother reminds me of the element with the sister in pet cemetery and the bedridden and all this kind of stuff like that it takes definitely from that it takes definitely from it follows it takes definitely from other things like that but it's stands on its own movie so essentially what happens is we have this psychiatrist that i believe she's a doctor of sorts or i can't remember exactly her position so she she sees this person that's just like smiling at her comes in one day and she commits mass suicide in a very nasty gory way in front of her and um so she kind of tells the police and everything like that and uh you know what happens is uh she kind of follows this chain uh, and she realizes she does some research and anybody who committed suicide in front of somebody else they eventually commit suicide as well. It is very much, and it follows a very much a ring story here. You know, you pass that on and you're, you're SOL. So she starts to, you know, has a certain amount of time before she can figure out her own death. I, I like these kind of stories, you know, you, you're, you're beating against the clock and the very final climax, we learn what the smile is and it's fucking horrifying and, and what the smile can do. It's, you know, it's, it feels like a more serious it too, you know, like how it can take these forms, but this thing will take its form as well. And, and like, it is like it follows. It's very much, like in a vein of it follows but it's very effective at the same time and it's scary as shit and uncomfortable and the end of this movie was a knockout i i was very uh uncomfortable during it and it really pushed it forward um it is i think it does runs a little long if i'm not mistaken but i was very impressed with it and i definitely want to rewatch. i might my opinion might change it probably will go up but i did enjoy it and i thought that there was some really unsettling imagery and smile 
The next one here is a really intelligent movie that's on uh, Amazon Prime. I thought it was intelligent from 2022, of course, and this is Master. Now, uh, my friend Dave Z told me to check this one out, and uh, so, so I put this on, and it is, it, I would call it horror enough, if that makes any sense. Some people wouldn't listen to this horror because some of the reveals and things in there. So we kind of follow the story of a young girl who gets accepted to this very expensive college. She's an African-American girl, and, uh, you know, she goes in there, and they give her a room, and at first they say, oh, you got the room, huh? And they kind of laugh, and it feels very kind of unsettling you feel very uncomfortable for her, like she's an outcast in this kind of like rich elitist kind of school where everyone seems accepting you know they have a lot of black people on you know the staff and the faculty and all this kind of stuff and they have someone uh, african-american descent kind of looking over everything i can't remember what the term is i've not been to college for a very long time but you know i think it's regina hall and she's tremendous in this movie as well and, and she's kind of like the uh, main other main character of the film so what happens is we start to unfold like this backstory, this this kind of like old wives tale or this folklore that happened at the school where there's this witch and it ties all the way back into the town's history and like every every semester the witch picks somebody and they commit suicide. The person before, um, you know, that lived in this room committed suicide. She was a young African American girl, so it, it adds a stigma, this racist stigma there, and there's a lot of turmoil between characters. And they do a lot of things really really well. Like she's going to this party and like her friend goes in and then the other guy stops her says sorry we're all fold up and, and she's just like but but my friend and then her friend comes out and gets her and it's just like fucked up shit like that um and, and they handle like the whole like racist thing really well there's a couple characters that these like things are revealed and it's really fucked up and it's really twisted and weird and it gets it takes a really dark turn and it kind of changes focus for a while but i thought that the movie had a lot to say i thought that it was handled really well and i thought there's a lot of layers it wasn't just so you know by the numbers like stuff like that or, or shove it down your throat i thought that it handled the thing well and with finesse and a little different and more realistic and more you know subtleties in it the the small little nuances that a lot of movies don't have so i thought that this was very impressive and very well made and i think a lot of people will enjoy this i recommend you check out master on amazon prime Okay, the next one is on Shudder, and it's A Wounded Fawn, directed by Travis Stevens, who did last year's Jacob's Wife, which I enjoyed. And this one, um, I like it. I, I, this one's definitely one that I would like to rewatch. I think this and Fresh kind of share a lot of similarities. And there's a lot of these kind of movies here where we have, like, this, like, toxic, weird kind of man and, you know, kind of, like, having these people be isolated, two, two-hander kind of movies. So, uh, essentially what we have here is this character in, uh, I don't remember the actor's name, Josh Rubin. And he's really bizarre, and he's into like this rich high call like art world. Again, we have the art world coming in here, right? And um, it's a lot of things coming out, like that creep show episode had it too, and it's just been around in a lot of movies lately. So this high class art place where they take bids, and he loses his bid on this uh, this very valuable piece, and he ends up following the woman home, and he talks to her, and he says, "Listen, I have a client that wants to buy this," and he seems to be drawn by this kind of strange entity, and he kills her. And he takes the piece. We kind of fast forward and now this girl's got a date. We know who it's going to be with. It's going to be with our, our creep. She doesn't know how creepy he is. Takes her to an isolated cabin. Hey, think fresh. Very much like fresh. I'm not saying this is ripped fresh off. It's just, you know, it's in, you know, the, the, the mindset of the culture nowadays, right? Maybe COVID helped to slim down and have a minimal cast. So basically takes her out to the cabin and there's a lot of tension. And you don't know how much she knows. You don't know how much he knows. And there's something else going around the cabin, something else kind of haunting the cabin. So we start to like kind of play cat and mouse, but also there seems to be some maybe a haunting. And uh, as things are more revealed, there's an injury that takes place and it kind of turmoil it changes everything and we kind of change tone into this kind of bonkers weird hallucinatory kind of thing and it gets really cool and different and i don't know if i preferred the first i think i preferred the first half i didn't really know but i did enjoy the uh, overall it did start to get a little lose its focus for me maybe i lost my focus that doesn't mean the movie did and I, overall i thought this was pretty solid pretty good well shot well made good sound design no real complaints about the technical stuff and the acting it's really good and uh everything like that um so i need to rewatch this i'm i don't know if i'll have time it probably could go up it's like a six and a half seven or somewhere around there maybe a little less than seven i think it could be higher and i think maybe i didn't give it a fair shake but i did enjoy it and i did like it a wounded fawn on shutter definitely worth checking out
Okay, the next one is the Patreon pick, and I believe this was a Jim Simon, and he picked the Duke of Burgundy, which is directed by Peter Strickland, who did stuff like In Fabric, Barbarian Sound Studio. Studio. He has a movie this year that I'm going to check out that's on, um, that is actually on um, Shudder. So um, the Duke of Burgundy, and you know I've heard a lot about this film, and this is a weird film. Um, so it's basically a strange relationship here uh, between these two women, and it kind of cuts back and forth between them learning about insects, and you kind of learn about the you know, how elegant insects can be and how um you know i guess you'll say how detailed that they can be almost to like the point of like high fashion and and you know aristocratic kind of behavior within the insects if that makes any sense on the details so we do cut back and there's definitely supposed to be some like comparison and simile between the women and the insects and the fashion and what they think oh it's a strange film so um and maybe even like a butter a cat, uh, you know cat uh what is that a chrysalis or whatever the caterpillar i don't know if they go into that it's more like a lot of locusts and things like that so Basically, um, the opening of the film, um, this is spoilers here, I thought was super interesting because it completely changes everything. Um, you, you think the film is one thing, you think these characters are one thing, but then it's not, which I really enjoyed. And I can't remember the weird movie, was it uh, Braid, Braided or something like that that came out a few years ago, which kind of feels in the vein of that too, um, which was a very good film. So this one... Um, it's, it's well shot, it's brilliantly well acted, and I don't think this will be for everybody. It's kind of a twisted demented love story about BDSM shot in a very high class uh, kind of element so it's like it's classy but trashy but you would never know it's trashy because it's made so classy if that makes any sense think Euro horror you know or European films like I would compare it to like the John Roland movies but just a, a little bit less horror a little bit less you know explicit in its content although the content is very explicit what they show you I should say so essentially um, the, the there's this girl she's brought over to clean for this woman and the woman is treating her horribly being very you know you know massive uh, sadistic very much a sadist and then as it progresses we learn that this is partially a game and the woman who was originally thought to be that you know domineering one actually is the one who may have more feelings for it and doesn't want this to go too far into this realm of you know uh, BDSM and it gets more and more and you learn more about the people and it almost starts to turn power struggle into this strange way until um, I don't want to spoil the ending but uh, it's well shot it's well made it's just a bizarre film about these two characters you know and their psychological sexual urges and, and issues and, and the relationship. It, it's well made. Like I said, I like it. A smarter person could write papers about how you compare the insects and all these kind of things with each other and the women in there. Yes, this movie should have a million essays written by Cat Allinger, uh, visual essays on it. This should be maybe an arrow or something like released a little bit deeper in there. But anyways, I really enjoyed this one. It's probably my favorite Peter Strickland movie out of the three I have watched. I will watch, 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 try to watch Caitlin Varga and uh, the new one um, but I think this one sits on top for me, um, Duke of Burgundy. I think it's better than In Fabric, and I think it's better bur than Barbarian Sound Studio for myself. Now, he makes these strange films that you think are one thing, and they're playing on these other kind of like subgenres, but they're not, and they're just weird. And they never really deliver what people want, which is sometimes I think can be very frustrating. And his movies have frustrated me before, but this one did not. I thought this one was very good. Okay, guys, before we get into the questions and answers, I want to give a shout out to Jim Carroll for uh, being a patron. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. And I did get your patron picks for November and December. So questions, answers. Uh, basically, uh, Ken Coakley says, um, I don't remember if I asked the question last week or not. Ken Coakley says, I was watching King of New York and came up with an unusual thought. I guess this goes under what role would you like to see played by another actor? But I thought Christopher Walken would have been a good choice to take over for Robert Ginty in any uh, further exterminator films. Yeah, at the time for sure. Um, I thought about it years ago when I saw Walken in a TV movie called who am I this time in which Walken played an extremely shy librarian who comes out of his shell when he acts on stage doing community theater Susan Sarandon plays his love interest I recommend it if you can find it this is regarding your acquisition of John Savage's film A Soldier's Revenge I want to watch it but can't find it streaming anywhere I'm a huge John Savage film after seeing him in Hair one of his earlier films The Killing Kind is on Blu-ray from Vinegar Syndrome both movies I have seen um, the two films Savage did that I liked were The Young Infield and 79. It's based on a true story about the murder of a Los Angeles police detective um, at the hands of two petty crooks played by James Woods and Franklin Seals of Silver Spoons. I think Franklin Seals was also in Southern Comfort, if I'm not mistaken. Woods and Savage reunited in 1986 for another great film, Salvador. That's the uh, Oliver Stone film, if I'm not mistaken. The second John Savage film I liked is called a thriller called The Amateur. In that film, Savage plays a CIA analyst who goes into the field to train to be an assassin after his girlfriend is killed in a terrorist bombing. But his best film, in my opinion, was The Deer Hunter. Savage's sister, Robin Young, was the local TV personality here in Boston when The Deer Hunter 
was nominated. Yeah, of course, you know, Deer Hunt is a classic. Uh, as an aside, uh, two horror actors who were also TV personalities here in Boston were Joe Beth Williams of Poltergeist and Robert Prosky from The Keep and Christine. They did a kid's show in the very early 70s called Jabberwocky. Very cool. I've uh, got to love Robert Prosky, right? And then we have Subjective Perspective Collective. Haven't listened in a while, but always good while I'm at work to hear your thoughts on film in general. I see on a going thread in the physical media community where people on only enjoy the obscure. I don't discriminate. If it's good, it's good. No matter if it's low budget, obscure, or huge budget, popular. Keep doing what you're doing. Thanks, brother. I like it all, man. Uh, Patrick Esteban, thank you from France. You are welcome from America. And then we have Nick Moore. A brief fun episode, sir. A bit sad to hear that even zombie comedies are becoming stale. They've always a lot been stale for years. Um, long gone are the days of Shaun of the Dead and Cockneys vs. Zombies, it seems. Um, you know, there is zombie movies constantly being made that are good, though. I wasn't sure about Bones and all, but uh, after you reveal it, check it out for sure. I would recommend it. Uh, question. And I should mention it is shot on film, if that entices anyone. Question. Sequels can get so lazy. Uh, think Hills Eye of Eyes Part 2 or Ulai Lumel's The Boogeyman 2 and 3 in which there is extensive use of flashbacks from the original. Do you have any other examples of sequels using too many flashbacks? Well, of course, I mean Silent Night, Deadly Night 2 is a huge culprit, although I've never watched Part 2, believe it or not. But yeah, that uses a lot of flashbacks, of course. What's the biggest, most ridiculous box set you ever purchased? For me, it's the Harry Potter Ultimate Collection. I have trouble carrying it. You know, it's got to be something like that Godzilla box set just because it's so bulky and huge. But I think it's the Herschel Gordon Lewis. I bought not the cereal box, but the one next, and it's fucking enormous. Or the Gamera set. Those are huge. Um, take it easy, and I hope it's warmer in your part of the world. Um, no, but not really. Probably not. But uh, yeah, we're going to hop into the update, and it's a pretty big update, so uh, bear with me. Some good stuff in there, though. It's probably the largest update in a long time. Okay, let's get into this update, and the first thing up is going to be the Shaw Brothers. Volume 2. Shaw Scope Volume 2. I had to have it. Um, they got me hooked. Watched all the first one. What do we got on this bad boy? So we got, um, let's see, um, the 36th Chamber of Shaolin, the Return of the 36th Chamber and Disciples of the 36th Chamber, Mad Monkey Kung Fu, Five Super Fighters, Invincible Shaolin, The Kid with the Golden Arm, A Magnificent Ruffians, The Tiger of Kung Tuong, My Young Auntie, Mercenaries from Hong Kong and the Boxer's Omen, uh, Martial Arts of Shaolin, The Barefooted Kid. So disc 9 is the music and disc 10 is more music. And these sets are really cool. If you've not had the first one, recommend it. Loved it. Uh, can't wait to dive into the second one. Might be a while though. So let's hop into some of the uh, non-Vinegar Syndrome stuff real quick. There's a bunch of Vinegar Syndrome stuff. The first one up is from the Kino Sale, and this is Trackdown. I've heard a lot about this. I heard about it on Pure Cinema Podcast. Heard it about, in the, I think, uh, the, Tar uh, the Tarantino's a fan of it, if I'm not mistaken. This sounds like really good stuff. I love Westerns. Um, big fan. Uh, yeah, so definitely going to be checking that bad boy out. Then we have uh, Terror Squad. This looks like exploitation fun. Uh Chuck Connors? Yeah, look at I don't think Chuck Connors on there. That bad guy looks so greasy on the front there, both of them. So, yeah, look at Chuck Connors with that chagrin on his face. Uh, yeah. Could you call that a chagrin? I don't even know if you can use that, that term. Anyways, this looks like fun. I love it. it, it always buy the key, stuff on the Kino sales. Then we have Ace High with Eli Wallach, Terrence Hill, Brock Peters, Kevin McCarthy, Bud Spencer. Come on, man. That cast is great. I, I think this is like a comedy western. Looks very fun. Uh, all great people in there. So, yeah, I look forward to checking this one out. Uh, yeah, looks like a, a group of guys, you know, going on a mission or something. I love that shit in the western movies. Then we have uh, Hudson Hawk. I had to have the released of, uh, from Kino. If you guys don't know me, I am a huge fan of Hudson Hawk. Catch the excitement. Catch the adventure. Catch the hawk. Um, this is one of my favorite movies. When it came out, I never registered. Everyone hated it. Me and my family always loved it. And then I guess I guess everyone hates it now. But, okay. I, not, I mean, it's kind of an infamous turd, but I don't get it. And I never will. I think it's great, and I think it's way ahead of its time. Uh, I love Bruce Willie back in the day. Then we have Happy Birthday to Me, this release. I've had the other one, but I wanted to upgrade. This is a fun slasher. Some people consider it actually American Giallo. I think it's Canadian Giallo, technically. But then we have uh, Glenn Ford's in here. Yeah, the great cover art. Never forget that cover art. Uh, this is a fun slasher, though, if I remember. Matt Craven's in there. 
what else do we got here? Uh, the Champagne Murders with Anthony Perkins. Gotta love Anthony Perkins. Uh, try to get anything with Anthony Perkins in it. He never disappoints. Always a solid actor. Uh, unfortunately, no typecast after Psycho. But uh, also Claude Chabrol, who's a great director, a French director. Seen about ten of his movies. And then we have uh, The Old Stone. This sounded really interesting. You know, it seems like a, uh, is a Korean here. And it was a good price. Uh, is this like a, a crime film or a serial killer thing? I just it, It's just like I remember reading it. It's like, oh, for the price, this looks like a very good, you know, a solid film. Was it Chinese? I'm not, I'm not 100% sure on that one. I remember just catching my eye. This one I bought at Big Lots when I was there on Sane. I didn't think I had the DVD of uh, the Blu-ray. I know there's a 4K, but for 3 bucks, I figured, why not? Now let's get into the Vinegar Syndrome stuff and the partner labels. Um, I also picked up Mind, Body, and Soul, but I reviewed that, so it won't be in here. So we have Minefield with Michael Ironside and Christopher Plummer's in this. Uh, Lisa Langolas, too. Um, this I had on VHS, and I never freaking watched it. Um, it's it just very memorable VHS for me. Uh, so I remember this VHS and mind ripper and there's all these like mind, uh, mind, uh, war. What was that one with the creature mind killer? There's a lot of these like mind movies growing up. I remember at the video store Then we have the good book, um, which is this the Saturn's core release? If I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Saturn's core here. The 17th release looks very bizarre, very weird, very transgressive experimental kind of shit going on here. So yeah, looks cool. Then, of course, Roadhouse, which has been a while since I watched it. You know, I was never the biggest fan of Roadhouse. I appreciate it. It's a lot of fun. It's got tons of goons, and it's got a very quotable stuff. It's a good movie. It just wasn't, you know, like one of my personal favorites. But these releases are so beautiful, right? It's like, how can you say no to this kind of stuff in here? They're just really done, these uh, special releases that they do. I mean, at this point, it's just like so much in here that it's insane. It's a 4K. Got to have my boy Sam Elliott in 4K. Love Sam Elliott, of course. You know, Big Lebowski. And uh, always got to love him for Tombstone. Uh, big fan. Tombstone is one of my all-time favorites. Those those cases are amazing, too. We got the VSAs here. We have, uh, is this the first Santo movie? Santo vs. Dr. Death. And I've seen uh, about 10 Santo movies. And I enjoy them. They, they registered. You know, some are better than others, right? We're talking, what, what year was this Santo one? 73, so not not. it's kind of late for Santo. I imagine he went on a little longer. But, you know, some of those movies, Santos are like late 50s, and then we have some like, there's a couple in 1970. But you got to love Santo. you got to watch at least one Santo movie. And then we have Cynthia Rockwell, Sworn to Justice. This looks like fun. Um, these kind of like B-movie martial arts movies I used to rent as a kid. They all kind of bleed together in one like action nonsense thing. When I, you know, I don't remember if I've seen these ones. Um, this one, maybe I have seen it. Um, I can't remember the one like, I think Tiger Claws, not the first one, but like one of them, somebody like, I don't remember. I, I can't, I mix it up. Maybe I've seen that one, to be honest. Maybe I've seen Sworn of the Justice. Invisible Maniac by Riff Coogan. That's right. If you guys ever seen this, that's Adam uh, Adam Rifkin. And this movie's pretty ridiculous, if I remember. It's been so long, though. Um, you know, those old classic movies where somebody's invisible or has powers, and you know what they do? They fucking molest people. This is on 4K. I didn't even know this was a 4K because I get the early package. Invisible Maniac on 4K. What are we even doing here? Like, what What in what world is this Invisible Maniac on 4K and, and Day of the Fucking Dead isn't? Not that I hate Invisible Maniac. I love that this is on 4K, but that shit's funny to me. Then we have Evil Laugh, which I haven't seen in years. This is kind of like a comedy slasher, if I'm not mistaken. I remember it being very kind of enjoyable. Isn't there a microwave killing this, if I'm not mistaken? Yeah, there it is. It's on the back. Ah, shit. Man, my memory is weird. Why do I remember that? Like, that's the cover I remember right there. Yeah, cool stuff. Um, Evil Laugh. Been years. I don't know why I've seen Evil Laugh. It's funny. I'll see Evil Laugh, but I won't have seen, like, a classic. Then we have Freeway. This movie is awesome. This is a classic. Ma Matthew Bright directed this. Did he direct both? One and two? One and two are both cool. One's better. One's a better movie. Kiever Sutherland, Reese Witherspoon. This is a cool movie, guys. If you've never seen Freeway, I really recommend it. Uh, Little Red Riding Story, 4K. Just a crazy-ass movie. Sleazy, trashy, funny. Uh, good stuff. Good stuff. Then we have Burning Paradise, which is a Hong Kong flick, if I'm not mistaken. This looks like a lot of fun. Ring, Ringo Lam. Uh, I don't think I've seen this one. I'm pretty sure I have not. I probably would have remembered it. It looks wild. Um, yeah. 
Look forward to checking that out. Um, most Hong Kong movies, I'm not going to lie, I like almost every Hong Kong movie I've watched. I've never seen one like, unless they were like so poor quality that I couldn't see shit or something. That was not the movie's fault. Oh, Homegrown Horse Volume 2. Love this. Uh, love that these are out. We have Hanging Heart, which I don't even know what that is. Moonstalker, which I've never watched, but I know it. And Dead Girls, which I've seen more than once for some fucking reason. Um, <laughs> Dead Girls isn't great. Maybe on a... On a Blu-ray, it'll prove. So, Moonstalker. That looks like fun. Dead Girls. I remember this. It's like a rock and roll group slasher movie. They're getting picked off. I didn't even know that was on film. Man, if you would have asked me, I would have guessed that was, uh, you know, I would have guessed film maybe, but I would have said that probably the elements are lost. And it was, Sorry, I bumped the thing. It's going to be loud. Edited on tape or some shit. I'm surprised they found elements on that one. Hanging Heart. This one I don't know. Huh. Strange. I don't know this movie. I've never heard of this fucking movie. So, until they released it. That rarely happens, guys. When it comes to horror movies from a certain time frame. I, I don't know what it is. That's, unless it had an alternate name or something. And then we have one more title here. And it is the Picarama that I picked up. Satan was a lady. And come with me, my love. I do want to show you the inside, but I'm sure it's red. No, it's not. It's not too bad. No nudity there. I know I don't want the YouTube police to get mad about some a pair of boobs or something. But uh, that is the update. Um, yeah, there won't be as much next week, of course. Maybe a couple movies here and there. But, yeah, we are out of here. Okay, thank you very much, guys, for watching. And as always, have a good one. Bye.